Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And really, I mean, the previous two interventions really uh, are a wonderful segue to get into mine because I'm going to address uh, many of the issues that were touched upon by both uh, Mr. Van Dalen and, and our chairman. The three issues that I want to touch upon is, first of all, this perception or this claim that Euro membership is the driver of bad macroeconomic outcomes in some member states, particularly in southern Europe. Um, the second one is the issue of a falling price level or deflation and the monetary policy response and whether it, should, it, it is really an issue that should concern us in the way that it does today. And then thirdly, um, I want to address some of the governance proposals that have been made in the wake of the Eurozone crisis, particularly with regard to a transfer of fiscal union and whether that is a well-suited response to the sorts of problems that we have identified um, and, and, and to ensure the Eurozone's integrity for the future, which is really something that should concern us, uh, regardless of what one thinks of what the composition of the Eurozone itself should be. So first of all, it has been claimed that the euro has made Mediterranean economies less competitive and that it's prolonged bad economic outcomes. In particular, numbers that you often hear is unemployment in Spain, which reached over 25% in 2012, although it's come down, but only to 20%. Um, now, it's also mentioned that Italy hasn't grown uh, in real terms since 2000. Um, and it is associated, those economic outcomes are often associated with the introduction of the single currency. Now, there are two problems with this narrative. The first problem is that it doesn't really explain why some countries have succeeded under the euro, even countries that underwent a very severe crisis uh, from 2008, why they've recovered strongly. Uh, so, for example, we have probably the most salient example is Ireland, which has been growing very strongly at 7 8% on average uh, since 2011, 2012. And then more recently, Spain, which has created one and a half million jobs, even at that high level of unemployment, um, from about 2014. And this has happened after a significant domestic labor market reform. And the second problem is that the issues that uh, have been identified as problems of Euro membership really were issues that are persistent in these countries' histories, if we look back. So I have the first slide there that shows um, unemployment in Spain over a 40-year period. I don't know if... Has anyone got the... Uh the slider, the, I don't think that's it. Sorry, we can. <laughs> it's like passing along the euro, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, sorry. First slide there, you see Spanish unemployment. Now, we see 25%, of course, in the recent crisis, but this is not a level that was unheard of, or at least the environment, the, that sort of 20% mark wasn't unheard of in previous Spanish crises. We saw that in the late 1970s at a time of industrial crisis in Spain. You also see it in the early 90s, which is another time of, of uh, significant economic weakness after the industrial transformation uh, and some banking crises around that time. Um, so it's, it's a persistent problem. And really the same, I mean, a similar problem is identified in the case of Italy in that real rates of average growth had been declining for quite some time. Uh, before the introduction of the euro. And indeed, already in the 90s, you see quite significant weakness in the average real rate of growth. And then thirdly, perhaps, if we want to look at France, uh, French unemployment, again, reached 10% in the last crisis, but it was at 10% in the mid-90s at the time of Mitterrand, and youth unemployment, again, has been a problem for several decades. And so my contention is that, and this was hinted at by our chairman as well, my contention is that the problems of poor economic performance or the, the factors behind poor economic performance are domestic. And they particularly have to do with heavy regulation, particularly of labor markets, a heavy reliance on taxation of uh, labor income and social security contributions to finance government revenue. That's something that we see particularly in Mediterranean economies. Um, it's not the case in more competitive economies uh, in the Eurozone. And I think that is responsible for unemployment being so upwardly elastic during crisis. Um, it is very difficult to adapt to decreasing demand uh, with the rigidity of labor market regulations. And so you have significant increases of unemployment uh, during crisis and also high rates of structural unemployment as you see in France. Um, and so it shouldn't surprise uh, any of us, that all of these countries that we're talking about often come uh, in the rankings as some of the least, as some of, oh, right there, as some of the uh, most, um, worst performers in, in terms of labor market freedoms. Um, so that's, that's really what I see as the cause behind these bad macroeconomic outcomes. It's purely, almost purely, domestic factors. There might have been some teething problems of Euro introduction, uh, but it's mostly a domestic issue. Now, the second uh, topic is the monetary front and the issue of falling prices. 
because low inflation since 2014 at or about 0 percent on average in the eurozone and falling, a falling price level in many countries, um, is a concern to many policymakers. And, you know, the monetary policy response, which has been very easy money, um, injection of liquidity and so on, does not seem to have meaningfully lifted price growth in the crisis countries. And in Germany, of course, it's led to a political backlash because savers are being hurt. Um, and the account of deflation that we hear as reflective of a weakness in demand is, is something that is the conventional economic account since the Great Depression, that deflation reflects weak demand and, and sort of a sign of persistent weakness in the economy. But that, although this is sort of the, the image that comes to mind, demand falling down and so both output and prices fall down, that is only one account of deflation. We must remember that a falling price level is not always the product of a drop in demand. In particular, deflation can result from falling real input prices, for example, a decrease in the oil price or cost reductions through innovations. They can be the consequences of liberalizing public policy. So is there something wrong with the... Oh, right, sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, they can be the consequence of uh, liberalizing public policy reforms, for example, labor market deregulation or introduction of competition uh, into markets. Um, which make goods and services cheaper to produce. And deflation caused by such developments is not an indicator of economic weakness. It is a sign that economies are becoming more productive. That is a type of deflation, which is su supply moving to the right, so you see how output can increase at a lower price level. That's the sort of uh, price in deflation that we saw in the 19th century a lot when there was a lot of innovation, better use of resources. And so as a result, they were able to lower prices at the same time as they increased output. Now, the, the fall, another, another driver of the falling price level can be an aging or a, shrink, or, or a shrinking population, which is something you see in Japan and also as we saw yesterday in the demographics uh, session increasingly in Europe as well, because that lowers growth expectations. It pushes down the savings rate. And uh, because older individuals have different spending patterns, it may also change the structure of, of, of price increases and price decreases in, in a significant way. Um, but whatever we think of, of the causes behind the Eurozone crisis, it cannot be denied that these things are taking place in Europe at the same time as perhaps weak demand. So we have a fall in the oil price, we have innovation, we have public policy liberalization, um, and we have an aging population. So I would, I would submit that uh, these are important factors in the sort of falling price level that we're seeing. And so the monetary policy response is not well adjusted to that. Now, finally, what reforms must be undertaken to ensure the survival of the euro over the long term? The Five Presidents Report, which is the main institutional outline of the um, changes that should take place, talks about a common treasury, uh, the harmonization of taxes, a common minimum wage policy, perhaps, and the mutualization of national debts. Um, I think there are many reasons to be wary of such an agenda. Tax harmonization would remove pressures for countries to become more competitive and to attract economic activity. A common minimum wage policy, even if it doesn't involve a single minimum wage, will increase labor costs in the less competitive countries. And that will uh, have very bad consequences for domestic economic performance. And in general, also the political implications of a minimum wage are for it to rise over time. So these problems, can, we can expect them to get worse over time. And then the mutualization of debt would create what's in economics called moral hazard, uh, which is uh, a, a greater willingness to take risks and to do negative things because you no longer bear the costs of it. So in exchange, in, instead of that, um, I really have what is relatively, um, a relatively simple I think, alternative agenda. First of all is continued liberalization and market reforms at the domestic level. That's absolutely essential. And really, when we see recoveries, we see them as a result of public policy change. Then a return to the stability and growth pact. And particularly within that, uh, I would endorse uh, Van, Mr. Van Dalen's um, argument that there should be some changes to it so that uh, you can actively enforce it and you don't have the sort of political problems that you face now. And then thirdly, the restoration of the no bailout clause and probably a bankruptcy mechanism of some sort so countries can stay within the euro system, but at the same time, uh, they are able to restructure their economies properly when they go very deeply into debt. And I think with that agenda, you will already go very far in terms of addressing a lot of these issues. And with that, I will finish. Thank you.